talk today, so um, let's see how this goes. Uh, essentially, my starting point was uh, this pilgrim badge. So I'm sure you've all seen this image before. This is a beautiful badge that was found by Tony Thera a couple of years ago, and it depicts the martyrdom of uh, Thomas Beckett. So Thomas Beckett, it, well, he's a, he's a big figure uh, in my life and in many people's lives, particularly next year, uh, because next year, 2020, is a very significant anniversary for uh, Thomas himself at Canterbury. So if you're unfamiliar with the story of Thomas Beckett, he is the Archbishop of Canterbury who was martyred in his own cathedral, so in the northern transept of uh, Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, on this side of the slide, you can see uh, a, a, a marble, which is held in the Metropolitan Museum of Art from around 1400, uh, which shows his martyrdom. So he was attacked by uh, four knights, very violent and horrible story. And on the other side of the slide, you can see the uh, altar of the sword point. So that is the location in Canterbury Cathedral where uh, he was murdered. So 2020 is the 850th anniversary of his uh, martyrdom and the 800th anniversary of his translation. So essentially, his body was moved from downstairs to upstairs uh, after they, they rebuilt the eastern end of the cathedral after a suspiciously well-timed fire in 1174. Um, Thomas Beckett is a huge uh, figure in Canterbury, but what I wanted to talk a little bit more about today was Thomas Beckett in London. So, uh, Thomas was born in London, 1118, 1119, 1120, uh, born on Cheapside, and he would have actually referred to himself as Thomas of London. So he is very much uh, one of us. Um, and there is a, there's a lot of interesting things that we can pick out around London's sort of claiming of Thomas Beckett in the period after his martyrdom. And I'm indebted to the work of a, a lot of other uh, much cleverer scholars, scholars, scholars <laughs> than I am uh, who've been doing a huge amount of work around Thomas Beckett in the period leading up to Beckett 2020 next year. So we're starting here with an image of the Common Seal of London from around 1219. And the first part of this talk is to look at sort of how Thomas is visible in the London landscape in that period after his martyrdom. So in the, in the end of the 12th century and moving into the 13th century. So you can see this quote here from William Fitzstephen writing in around 1180. Who was a who was a, a a colleague of St Thomas's? He would have known him, and he says St Thomas has adorned both these cities, London by his rising, and Canterbury by his setting. And here on the the, the back of this seal, which is held in the Museum of London, you can see Thomas of London sort of enthroned. Um, so essentially, he's one of the two saints of London. So St Paul is on one side of the seal, St Thomas is on the other. In that sort of post-martyrdom uh, landscape of London, Thomas is very visible. So we're looking here at um, a very sunburnt Bruce Watson, I think this is, during the excavations at Fenning's Wharf uh, on the south bank of the Thames for part of the uh, 12th century, 12th to 13th century London Bridge. So as you all know, London's Stone Bridge, uh, which goes in in the period sort of after Beckett's martyrdom, has a, uh, a chapel on the bridge which, which is dedicated to Thomas Beckett. So he's very, very visible on this major bit of sort of civic infrastructure that is going in in the decades after his death. The bridge is built by uh, a chap called Peter of Colchurch, or Peter de Colchurch, who actually comes from the same parish as Thomas Beckett, so the parish of St Mary Colchurch. So there are all these kind of interconnected uh, sort of community uh, connections here. And here from the uh, Church of St Magnus Mater, you can see a representation of this very spectacular uh, chapel to St Thomas Becket uh, on the bridge. In Southwark, uh, at Southwark Cathedral, or at St Mary Overy Priory, as it would have been known during this period, we have a hospital that may well have been founded 
uh, before, uh, so a part of the early 12th century foundation of St. Mary Overy, so it's around 1108, but is certainly uh, refounded or strongly associated with St. Thomas in that, again, in that period, sort of after his martyrdom. So we have the Hospital of St. Thomas, seen here in obviously a much uh, later view. I've done a lot of searching on the internet for the last couple of days, looking for pictures of things that I realise don't exist um, because no one had drawn them or painted them. But there are lots of lovely post-medieval images of said structures. So here we have St. Thomas's Hospital in the uh, probably 18th century. And then we have uh, this one. Now, this is uh, St. Thomas of Aiken, which is a, a, a much, well, certainly to me, was a much lesser known uh, religious foundation. This was founded by the sister of Thomas of Becket uh, on his birthplace. So here you've got St. Mary of Coal Church, which is his parish church. We have the Church of St. Thomas of Aiken here, uh, which is essentially part of one of those kind of military hospital orders. Um, and you can see the sort of street layout in the 17th century here. Now, the order of St. Thomas of Aiken still exists, uh, and they are Googleable. Um, and you can order their regalia uh, online. I haven't, but you can. Uh, and it is interesting to note that even in the 21st century, their symbol is still uh, a scallop shell. Uh, scallop shells uh, are obviously an associated symbol of pilgrimage. They're very much associated with St. James of Compostela, but Canterbury Christchurch seems to have adopted uh, the scallop shell for their earliest pilgrim badges um, in, a, in a sort of blatant attempt to... Um, cash in essentially on an already popular symbol of pilgrimage. Uh, so the earliest Beckett badges are, uh, are these sort of scallop shaped ampulla and we'll come on to uh, a bit more about pilgrim badges in a little while. So right in the centre of the city you have this hospital dedicated to St Thomas once again, founded by his sister and a, a site which played a very significant part in daily life in the city of London. So the bells of uh, St. Thomas Aiken were the symbol to open the city gates in the morning and they were also the symbol in the evening to close the markets. So they are a central part of the sort of life line of the city and also the site where a lot of uh, civic ceremonies took place. So you have lots of Lord Mayors visiting, you have processions that start and finish at the hospital and go up to St Paul's. So it's very much interwoven into the fabric of, of day-to-day -day, uh, life in the city, as is uh, this structure here. So this is the great conduit um, right across the road from uh, the Hospital of St Thomas Aiken, seen during excavations by Mola in the 1990s. And if you want to know where uh, this is, there is a <laughs> slightly uninspiring plaque uh, on the road in Cheapside. Uh, which marks the spot where this structure, I, I think, would still be surviving uh, under the ground there. So this is the Agast 18, uh, 16th century map. So Mary Cole Church is about here. The site of St Thomas Aiken after the dissolution becomes the Mercer's Hall. Again, the Mercer's are all interconnected with this story because Thomas uh, Beckett's father, Gilbert, was a Mercer. So we've got all, again, these little connections coming up. Here is the conduit right across the road. So the, the, the point I'm gradually sort of working my way towards here is an association with not only Thomas and London, but also Thomas and water, uh, and these kind of associations with watery places. Moving into the 13th century, we've got London Bridge in the back here, in this 15th century view. There's the chapel, and you see this very large structure here at uh, the Tower of London, which you see here in this modern view, shamelessly robbed of the Historic Royal Palace's website. Um, now, obviously, much more famously known as Traitor's Gate, it is actually the Tower of St. Thomas, built in the late 13th century as royal accommodation. So this sort of river-facing, very important part of the Tower of London is, again, dedicated to St. Thomas Becket. And you can see the tower here, uh, in this uh, view of around 1300, again, shamelessly robbed from historic royal palaces, so apologies uh, for that. But it is a fantastic view, and here you can see St. Thomas's Tower and its sort of watery location at the front there. So, here we have uh, the medieval map of London, 1270 to 1300. 
this is available to, not that I'm advertising, but this is, if you haven't seen it, this is available to buy from the Historic Towns Atlas and is an amazing resource for the study of medieval London. You have all of the parish churches, you have the streets, you have the major sites, and it's a, a really invaluable uh, resource. And it just shows this sort of, by 1300, the, the layout of the city, the density uh, of occupation, and the sort of growth that has taken place in London to make it the premier uh, sort of and most populous city in England by this period of time. So just to put a few dots on the map of the places we've been talking about uh, that are sort of connected with Thomas Becket in this landscape, You've got the, the Tower of St. Thomas at the Tower. You've got St. Thomas Aiken and the Great Conduit up in the centre of the city, the heart of the city, if you like. You've got the chapel to St. Thomas Becket on the bridge. And you have uh, the Hospital of St. Thomas over in Southwark. So it's almost impossible to see how, if you lived in 13th century London, you could avoid uh, Thomas Becket. He is uh, very much present. And of course, London is where you would find people setting off uh, on pilgrimage, as famously uh, memorialised in uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, travelling from London uh, out across the bridge, past Southwark, and down uh, the road, a few days ride or several more days walking down to Canterbury. Once you get to Canterbury, um, you can uh, obviously visit the site of the martyrdom, visit the site of the tomb from tw uh, of the shrine from 1220 onwards, and collect uh, your pilgrim souvenir. Um, the earliest, as I mentioned, pilgrim souvenirs, the Ampla, were were filled with um, what's called Canterbury water. So after this very grisly uh, murder, um, basically, and this is where it gets a bit grim. The monks scraped up uh, what was left on the floor uh, of, the, of the martyrdom um, and collected it all, again, with an amazing sort of sense of foresight here. Uh, and <laughs> what you could do, what you did, or what they did, was they would take a drop of uh, the matter, the blood, and mix it with water from um, a, a, a well. Lots of interesting things to say about that well. Um, and you would take home in your ampulla uh, a drop of Canterbury water, um, which gave, obviously, miraculously healing uh, properties. And I guess you could also drink it if you really wanted to, to, to go through that. Um, so what we're looking at here is an amazing survival. Uh, this is uh, an 1160s plan of Canterbury Cathedral showing the waterworks. Um, so showing how water comes on site and how it is also uh, drained off it. Um, so my current kind of interested question, as far as the Canterbury end of things goes, is where are they making these pilgrim badges, and where is the where are they putting where is the Canterbury water coming from? Because we know where the water is. This structure here is called the water tower. We've got another thing here which is called uh, a, a well. This is all in existence by the 1160s. <coughs> So how does that, you know, how does that actual process work of filling these little tiny bottles, handing them out to the pilgrims who are sort of processing their way along here, downstairs, up and along? Um, so there's lots of sort of interesting things to think about. And that, again, that connection with Thomas and water seems to be very, very important. So... The last part of this talk, I wanted to take it back a little bit further in time. We've looked at sort of 13th century London and how Thomas is represented in that landscape. What I wanted to do for the last bit was to have a look at 12th century London and to try and understand a little bit more about the city that the man himself might have uh, known. So he, he grew up in London, as I said, he was born, he grew up in London, he spent many years there. So what would he have kind of known, uh, what, would, what sort of things would he have seen in his local landscape. So we're starting here with this quote um, from one of the early lives uh, of St Thomas. Um, and uh, as the writer says, he was begotten in London, descended from and brought up among the lords of that city. When his mother first conceived him, she dreamed the water of the Thames entered her womb, and a learned man to whom she told this explained it, saying, your heir shall rule over many people. I think she carried living water in her in her womb. So uh, you couldn't get much more of a kind of 
Thomas Thames link there. So that is a, that's a pretty nice uh, way to start. So this is a, a, a reconstruction draw, drawing by Judy Stoby, which is in uh, Mola's publication called Heart of the City, which is about the excavations at number one poultry. So literally across the road from where Thomas Beckett was born. And this is the reconstruction of around 1100. So this is about, say, 20 years before Thomas Beckett was born. This is what that streetscape looks like. So you have a lot of timber framed houses, but you have a very organized sort of community here. We have backyards laid out, we've got property subdivisions, we've got uh, some buildings in stone, some of the churches are starting to be built in stone. Essentially, the 12th, 12th century London is very much a, a sort of period of transition. So we're, we're moving from uh, a, a much smaller city into a, the much sort of larger, more densely populated city that we saw on the map of the 1300s. In 1120, again, this is from a Mola publication. This is Chris Thomas's uh, Religion in Medieval London. So these are the parish churches that are sort of believed to be in existence by around 1120. Um, by the time that William Fitzstephen is writing in 1180, he says there are over 120 parish churches in the city of London. So we have, again, during the 12th century, this explosion in uh, the sort of ecclesiastical landscape, not only a massive proliferation of smaller parish churches, but also all of the, the large monastic sites that start being constructed around the walls of London and at, uh, on the South Bank during that 12th century period. So the landscape is very much uh, sort of changing um, and religion becoming very, very visible in that landscape. We know that uh, Beckett's first sort of benefice or his first connection with the church is actually in London. So he was the rector in the early 1150s of the Church of St Mary Le Strand, uh, so just outside the city walls. Uh, I'm not going to make a massive deal about the fact that it, it is a riverside church, but, you know, it is a riverside church. Um, <laughs> obviously, it hadn't been martyred by them, so I can't quite make that link, but you know where I'm going with that. Um, the, the city itself, sort of moving to look at the waterfront. So if you've been down to Queen Hyde, which Liz was mentioning this morning, there's a fantastic mosaic which runs along uh, one side of the river wall, created by the Clayground uh, Collective. And this is the, the, the sort of snapshot of the 12th century uh, panel. Now, the sort of 1130s is when Queen Hyde actually becomes known as Queen Hyde. Earlier it was known as Ethelred's Hyde. Uh, and that is because, as you can see on the mosaic, uh, Queen Matilda, wife of Henry I, is granted duties and all goods uh, landed at Queen Hyde. She gives the income to charities. One is a place of easement, brackets, toilet, at Queen Hyde. <laughs> so when I started looking around thinking, well, what have we got from 12th century London archaeologically? Of course, this one sprang to mind, which is a 12th century toilet. Um, it's a communal toilet found uh, in the Fleet Valley. Um, and if you manage to get to the Secret Rivers exhibition at Museum and Docklands, they had a frankly hilarious reconstruction of uh, the 12th century toilet. So you could go as a family, which we, we very much enjoyed. Um, the 12th century port has been uh, studied and written about extensively. Uh, so very, very detailed. Uh, and when I say very detailed, I mean over 500 pages of reporting <laughs> recently uh, produced by John Schofield, Lynn Blackmore, and Jackie Pierce. Uh, somewhat more accessibly, you can also read about it in Gus's uh, Port of Medieval London. Um, and the chapter around the 12th century port is the, is the port in transition. So we're looking at, a, a, like the churches, this sort of increasing regularization, increasing proliferation, and also increasing formalization. So we're moving in the 12th century on the waterfront from uh, a sort of beach market to wharf structures. So ending. Uh, with this sort of Plantagenet port, which you can see here in this reconstruction by Chris Unwin. So uh, a period of great change, not only in the city itself, but also, of course, on the waterfront. Uh, further downstream in Greenwich in 1194, we have the, uh, the excavations here by Mola again of the medieval tide mill. So we've got major infrastructure works also uh, along the river. 
Um, and excavations at Westminster Abbey. Um, again, so I'll just read quickly what uh, Chris Thomas has to say about that. So we have the documentary evidence, which suggests uh, lots of work being undertaken in the 12th century, and interestingly links that not only to um, the sort of need for uh, better wharfage for different kinds of vessels, but also uh, floods and climate change. So we're coming up to the end uh, here of, the, of a period called the medieval warm period. So we have increased flood events, we have rising river levels, and we have infrastructure that is needing to be in place in order to cope with these changes. So <coughs> there does seem to have been quite a lot of development uh, at the riverside site of Westminster Abbey. Um, and this is a quote from Tim Tatton Brown. So if you see, if we're looking at uh, Beckett and we're looking at archbishops, and he was the archbishop from 1162, what was happening at Lambeth Palace? Uh, so Tim has to say that essentially something must have been happening, but we haven't found it yet. Uh, so there's a, a potential project there in the future if the Archbishop of Canterbury will let us dig up his London garden residence, which would be nice. Um, so I, I, I basically, uh, in, in not in any particularly scientific way, decided to have a look on the PAS website to see what has been found that dates to the period around 1100 to sort of 1220. So what, what sort of finds have come up? Uh, and the answer was, and it may be that I've skewed this because I'm not very good at using it, but the answer was not, not very much, actually. Um, so we're going to not look at the ones that obviously come from uh, miles away, but focus for these. Uh, so dateable artifacts, uh, you'll be unsurprised, largely coinage. So uh, Henry I from Southwark, silver cut half penny, some uh, coins of Stephen, so sort of 1130s onwards, uh, from the City of London and from Westminster. Another rather lovely uh, Stephen penny here from Dowgate. Uh, gap, nothing as far as I'm aware from the reign of Henry II, who of course is the king who Thomas was uh, so famously clashing with. Uh, coin from Dowgate, a John cut half penny, and uh, a quartered cut farthing from the Tower of London, which I think is one of James's finds, if I remember I correctly. I thought you might. Um, other artifacts from around this period, so we have this uh, potential gaming piece from Southwark dated sort of 1150 to 1350, so that's quite a broad date range. This rather spectacular little item, which is from the Tower of London for sure, I think, again dated as a sort of 12th century uh, gaming piece with this rather sort of spectacular chap uh, on there. Um, this, which is a 12th century bone buckle, again, uh, Tower of London, for sure find, by Mark Jennings. And this, which is the base of a Mazer cup from Southwark, and again, the internet tells me that Mazer cups are used for drinking mead, so there we go. So that is uh, the sort of uh, metal objects and bone objects. In terms of ceramics, very specific kinds of ceramic being used in this sort of late 12th, early 13th century. The British Museum has a, a whole example, just says it's from London, so I can't say it's from the foreshore. Uh, a search of the PAS uh, revealed one, um, but again, I may just not be using it properly. This is from Thamesmead, and this is kind of London greyware. So this is sort of ceramic um, that, I don't know James is gonna tell me more about these, um, that we should be looking for, sorry? That was yours as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should have known, really. Um, so we really should, you know, if we're if we're looking for that that sort of twelfth century evidence, there's a, a as always with Moda, there's a handy book that you can buy that will help you to identify it. Um, and we maybe need to add some more pictures of the slightly earlier uh, ceramic that we would we might be looking for in the twelfth century. So last couple of slides, really. Um, what I was also looking for, for this sort of talk, was any structures that, that Thames Discovery might have found uh, on the foreshore or recorded or been part of recording on the foreshore that dated to this sort of 12th century period. Um, and there, uh, as far as I'm aware, and I'm happy to stand corrected, there is only one. Um, so, and this, this appears to be my only photo of it as well. It's not the easiest thing to photograph. So what we have here is the, the remnants of what's probably some kind of brushwood platform um, recorded by the Richmond Archaeological Society uh, on the foreshore at Kew. Um, dates to around 1070 to 1180s. 
so quite a broad date range, but that is our only sort of radiocarbon dated structure of this kind of period, of this sort of 12th century Beckett period <coughs> that, we, that I'm aware of uh, on the foreshore. That's really fascinating, given the amount that, of, of building and infrastructure and all of these things that are going on in sort of 12th and early 13th century London, the sort of artifactual record seems quite uh, uh, sparse, uh, and the structural record even more so. So I wonder whether you know, climate change has, uh, has an impact on that, whether we've got these more violent events which are washing things away. Obviously, in the central part of London, things are going to be buried under uh, later developments. But it's, it's just something to potentially sort of think about uh, in the future. So uh, I couldn't let uh, a, a, a lecture go by without mentioning fishing. Uh, so we are finishing with uh, a, 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 a part of the uh, 1170s-ish uh, stained glass windows from the North Choir Isle at Canterbury Cathedral, which shows uh, a fishing scene. Uh, and I encourage you all to go out and fish for more evidence, that's really loud, uh, for 12th century London. Thank you very much.